Well, that takes us to SimNet. Roughly in time, we're at the same period as the SGI flight simulator. In 1980, DARPA hired BBN, Perceptronics, and Delta Graphics and said, we want you to build some affordable networked virtual tank simulators. The film you just saw used the SimNet system. The quality of graphics you saw in that film was the quality of graphics these guys created for SimNet. They worked and worked and they built 250 of these simulators. They fielded them at roughly 11 sites. Uh, it's kind of leaked everywhere now. But they spent about $500 million figuring out how to do this, inventing the technology that is the network virtual environments that we use today. When they were done, they had three components that they said these are key to building a shared virtual world. Number one, you have to have some kind of object event architecture. You have to have a structure that says, here's information about the objects in the virtual world. My position, my orientation, my appearance. And you've got to have information about the events, the fact that I fired a weapon, the fact that an explosion happened, the fact that I crashed into a building, the fact that uh, the, the vehicle exploded, something that describes the events that are happening between the objects. The second one was you have to have autonomous simulation nodes. Computers and our software, I've written lots of software, and none of it's reliable. Eventually, it's all going to crash. And when one of these nodes crashes, you can't have the entire networked simulation environment stop and say, let's wait. Because you'll be waiting all the time. Because somebody will be crashing every few minutes or every hour. And you'll always be in wait mode and never be in operational mode. So the, the nodes have to be autonomous. And third, you have to use dead reckoning algorithms. If we're going to get beyond 10 vehicles on the network, you can't be sending out this information at frame rates. Because one, we want the frame rates to go higher. And two, we want the amount of detail on each vehicle to go higher. So therefore, the amount of time that we spend sending that information has to go lower so that we have enough bandwidth to share this world with hundreds of people, thousands of people. Well, here's a picture from SimNet. You already saw it in the film. And the SimNet software contained six components. The first component was the network interface. That's kind of obvious. You had to write some kind of software that was responsible for taking information about you and publishing it onto the network so other people know where you are, what you're doing. You had to have the software also listen to these same packets coming from other simulators so that you would know where other people were. So that's the network interface software. The second one was the image generator software. Again, pretty obvious. If you're going to create these beautiful 3D scenes, you're going to have to have software and hardware totally dedicated to rendering that scene for you. And you can't be interrupting this software and hardware all the time to say, just a minute, I got a network packet. Can you hold that frame a minute while I go get the packet and interpret it? You need to separate those two, packet, those two uh, operations. Third, you have to have control and di display software. Inside of a flight simulator's cockpit or inside of a tank simulator's cockpit, there are gauges and there are controls. There are driving controls and there are turning controls and there's joysticks. You have to have software that manages the exchange of information with those physical devices to make the gauges change, to make the uh, input from the steering wheel go into the simulation. Then you've got to have an other vehicle state table. All those network packets that are coming up to you from the other simulators, you've got to store that information somewhere. And that's the other vehicle state table. It's a table which describes where every object is and all of the state information that you know about that object. And fifth, you have your own vehicle dynamics model. Your own vehicle dynamics model is the very detailed, physics-based, in many cases, model of your vehicle. It knows everything about modeling a tank or a plane or whatever you're actually controlling. It may not know very much about the plane or the helicopter you're seeing in your visuals, but it knows a lot about what your vehicle does. And so that's the, actually the model of, in the SimNet case, of a tank. And then finally, there's sound generation. If you generate this 3D world and there's no sound, it's not real. The soldiers go, this is, this is a silent movie. Uh, you don't get their effects. 
unless you have the grinding of the tank treads as you drive, unless you have the explosion sounds, unless you have the recoil, unless you have all the, the chatter on the radios. If you don't have all that, infor that information hitting your ears, then your eyes don't buy it that, that they're really immersed and your emotions don't get involved. So you've got to get the sound there to get your emotions involved. One of the ways we used SimNet before uh, the Battle of 73 Easting was in Project Odin. And in Project Odin, we had these simulators. We had a virtual and a 2D map constructive view of the battlefield. And we took these out and said, what if we took the missions that we're about to execute at Desert Storm, load that information via the 2D map display, and then let people rehearse it, let the simulation carry it forward for you, and see how it's going to play out. And you can stand and look that on that 2D map and see how your, your vehicles are going to play through the terrain, where they might encounter the enemy, et cetera, et cetera. And better, you can step into the virtual simulator right next to it and see the same information in 3D. You can look out your viewports and recognize that you were looking in the wrong direction when you rounded that hill and you didn't see the enemy as soon as you should have seen him. You should, you should look a different direction before you round that hill. So we were trying to teach people how to use simulators as mission planning tools and that's what Project Odin was all about. It was an application of the SimNet technology we'd already created. Then came the Battle of 73 Easting. In the Battle of 73 Easting, things unfolded pretty much like you saw in the film there. And people started understanding the power of simulation, not only to uh, train people to get ready for those situations, but perhaps as a teaching tool for schools. If you go to a military college, they'll teach you a lot about historic battles. Well, create those historic battles in 3D virtual worlds so that you don't just see them as maps with big red arrows on them. You see it all around you and you get to be immersed in it. And so you get to fight Desert Storm even though you were a kid when Desert Storm happened. And so you get to experience the battlefield, not just a hypo hypothetical battlefield, but an actual battlefield that was fought you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. This really stimulated a lot of people to think, what can we do with these simulators? Stop thinking of them as just training devices that teach us how to operate our equipment. Start thinking about them in a bigger perspective. SimNet had a great career. Uh, it was used by our armor crew to prepare for a thing called the Canadian Armor Competition. And they sat down in SimNet and they got to go through the firing exercises that they were going to have to carry out in this competition. And they went through it again and again and again, more times than they could have gone through it with a real tank. And we went to the competition and for the first time in 10 years, we won. Usually other countries win. And the crews credited part of that with being in the simulator and getting to practice in the simulator. Now the Naval Postgraduate School was one of the places where those 10 students were playing with the SGI code and saying, we're just going to fly these flight simulators when they're supposed to be working on their assignments. And those guys said, let's build our own simulations. And Darryl, Doug Smith, Dale Stryer, and Mike Zaida sat down and they reworked the SGI flight code to create a fiber optically guided missile simulator, a fog M simulator. And at first it was just one vehicle in a virtual world and they practiced on, okay, we can put this virtual vehicle in a virtual world and they used it as a teaching tool. Now that one vehicle has evolved into what's called NPSNet now. NPSNet is a complete virtual environment. All kinds of vehicles, all kinds of behaviors in it and it's a fantastic teaching tool. You can now go to the Naval Postgraduate School and you can learn how to program these virtual worlds because they have a working one there. Now the Naval Postgraduate School wasn't the only place that does that. Uh, lots of other places had to have it as well. And it spread to Stanford and Sweden, Canada and Singapore and every place. And so there, now there are lots and lots of places that you can go and study networked virtual environments. Lots of places. But everybody isn't focusing on the military aspect. A lot of these places are saying, I just needed that military technology. I want to explore immersive virtual worlds for entertainment, for theme parks, for lots of other reasons, for manufacturing perhaps. 